So normal glucose levels, again, if you want to put a value down, maybe somewhere around 90 milligrams per deciliter, and that would be human. Um, and we're just going to see how the two antagonistic hormones work to regulate um, a homeostatic value for glucose. So what would be a stimulus <coughs> to increase in uh, blood glucose levels, at least transiently? Yeah, eat a bunch of crap. That's, I heard eat a bunch of crap. <laughs> I'm going to put it, eat carbohydrates. Okay. <laughs> We're just going to modify that a little bit. <laughs> and then we know that um, that's going to lead to increase in glucose in the extracellular fluid. You know, that surrounds and bathes these little pancreatic beta cells. And then we know through the pathway we just looked at that that's going to trigger the release of insulin from those beta cells. <coughs> so we've identified um, the gland that is producing the hormone. We've named the specific type of cell that produces the hormone. And we can name the hormone. Um, the next thing is to ask, you know, what are the target tissues for insulin? Um, which tissues is insulin acting on? We know insulin's going to ultimately uh, reduce blood glucose levels, but we don't know yet through what mechanisms it will do that by. So first thing, just basically all of those insulin-dependent cells um, stimulate the glucose transport. So now we can see these guys just kind of putting all those transporters into their membrane and taking up more glucose. Um, this one we don't really, we're just learning a little bit more about how insulin exerts these effects. But you guys might hear often some growth promoting uh, chemicals in the body are referred to as insulin-like growth factors. You know, so you'll commonly hear that's an insulin-like growth factor, insulin-like growth factor. And that's because we now do recognize that insulin can do things like stimulate uh, new protein synthesis in cells. Um, and some studies, in fact, where they fed the animals um, a meal that didn't have carbohydrate but had a complex mix of amino acids, so feed them this amino acid rich meal, that that even produced a slight increase in insulin levels. And now we recognize that that's probably because insulin has played some role in you know, telling cells to utilize those amino acids to synthesize new proteins. So it does promote growth to some extent. Um, and then in, the, in cells that are capable of um, storing away glucose as glycogen, and that would be um, mainly liver and skeletal muscle cells, um, those enzymes that convert glucose into glycogen, um, they get acted on by through through insulin. And you guys remember, do you remember kind of like the basic chemistry of what glycogen looks like? Yeah, just chains. So these three little circles I drew just represent free glucose molecules. Those are the molecules that are being taken up into cells. They have to be in the free form, these small glucose molecules. But glycogen, we're just starting to use enzymes to basically just start bonding <coughs> the free glucose molecules to form these highly branched uh, trees of glucose. So that would be the storage form. And not every cell in our body can store away sugar in this form. Um, one cost, you know, you might ask like migrating birds, um, they have to store away a lot of energy in preparation for migration. But when you look at how they're packing away their calories, they're primarily storing away the calories in a lipid form. And you might ask, well, why aren't they just loading up, doing carbo loading before they migrate? You know, I don't think a bird would eat spaghetti and potato, but why don't they just eat a carbohydrate-rich source and pack away their energy as glycogen? And the answer for that is that whenever we store sugar away as glycogen, um, it bonds a lot of water and holds a lot of water in the cell. So cells are made very heavy when they store away sugar. And uh, lipids are anhydrous. So if you can stuff cells full of lipids, there's no room for water. And the result is you get a lighter cell. So if you're a migrating bird, you have to consider the weight that you're going to transport these long distances. Um, so it makes sense that you can to store the energy away as this denser lipid form that's lighter compared to this um, less dense uh, caloric way that is heavier for the cell. Okay, so we know that there would be enzymes acted on by insulin to produce glycogen. 
And then the fat cells, um, don't think that fat cells have to take up lipid in order to store lipid. Because um, fat cells have metabolic pathways, they can take up amino acids, um, they can take up glucose, and then they can run them through these metabolic pathways and produce the lipid that they store. So don't have the impression that there's these scavengers, they can only feed on lipids. They can feed on other substrate and then convert it into the stored lipid form. So yeah, so insulin also plays a role there. Okay, so hopefully after all of these um, effects have been mediated, uh, that brings the circulating glucose levels back down. And then again, that's gonna have the effect ultimately to reduce glucose in <coughs> cellular fluid. And so now we see that that beta activation pathway we looked at previously just turns off. And we reduce the release of insulin. So we spent a lot of time with this one um, for the alpha cells in glucagon. Pretty much everything is just the reverse of what we see for insulin. The only thing that I didn't include in target cells or in target effects would be protein synthesis. So it doesn't appear that glucagon plays any role in modifying uh, protein synthesis activity of cells. That one seems to be primarily just associated with insulin hormone. Um, low glucose levels, maybe like fasting, for example. Do you guys remember the terms to describe these, like uh, taking glycogen and breaking it down into glucose? Yeah, that one's glycolysis. So lysing or breaking up the glycogen. Test your knowledge. How about fats breaking them down to release? Um, the lipids that are stored, they have a glycerol backbone as one component, and then there are three fatty acids attached, so they're called triglycerides. Um, but when the enzymes um, act, are active, they separate the glycerol backbone and free up the fatty acids. And it's the free fatty acids that cells can take up and use for energy. Um, so what is the name for that process? Um, breaking down fats, release free fatty acids and glycerol. Just things along the lines of lysis like we did for... Oh, lipolysis? Yeah. Lipolysis. So lice just break apart. And then this one, um, liver cells can synthesize glucose. We don't always think about cells in our bodies being able to produce a brand new sugar. We all think that we're dependent upon um, all the sugar levels that exist in our body ultimately come from the nutrients we ingest. But the reality is cells can use other products to produce new sugars in the body. Um, so liver cells, for example, can use lipids, they can use amino acids, and then they can process them to yield brand new sugar. So anybody want to tackle the term for, to describe that? New synthesis of glucose? Yeah, who said that? Somebody's in biochem. Emily? Gluconeogenesis? You got it right, so you don't have to be shy about putting that one out there. Okay. Do you guys have any questions then about this pathway?